Uh, Wukash, welcome. Uh, thank you for agreeing to be interviewed. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Normally, uh, in an interview, we ask uh, the person interviewed uh, to tell us what they do. Uh, it's not so easy with you. Uh, you have so many jobs. You're a subtitler, interpreter, re-speaker, theater captioner, translator, uh, researcher, uh, QCer, uh, PhD student, project manager. I would like us to focus now on your re-speaking hat. Uh, you are one of the first re-speakers in Poland. Could you tell us uh, briefly what a re-speaker does? So re-speakers are involved into, in creating live subtitling or what some people call live captioning. Uh, and they use speech recognition. So they listen to somebody speaking in an, in, on television or on, in a live event setting. And then they try to understand it. And then they sort of repeat it, but they don't literally repeat it. They reformulate it to get the message across. They speak in such a way so that the speech recognition can turn it with good accuracy into words. And then these words are, might be corrected or not, and they end up on screen somewhere and provide access to people who might be hard of hearing or for many other reasons might need this service to have full access. You're talking about intralingual re-speaking, right? Yes, this is a very difficult uh, distinction because it's just one letter and it makes a really big uh, Yes, difference. let us explain what is intralingual and what's the other type then. So intralingual re-speaking uh, is within one language. So we are now speaking in English and let's say there's a re-speaker sitting behind me and he or she, re they repeat the words that I use. They repeat my ideas and this is turned into text and this is shown on screen. So this is intralingual, there's just one language involved. But let's say we have viewers who don't understand the language we're using to communicate now and we can have an interlingual re-speaker who's also an interpreter in a way, who re-speaks my ideas not in English but let's say in Polish or in French or in Spanish in another language to provide access to people who understand this language. That's right, and I know you are part of the uh, ILSA project, Interlingual, Interlingual uh, Life uh, Subtitling for Access. Could you tell us a little bit about the project? Uh, ILSA is an exciting project because we have had re-speaking for many years in various countries, but we haven't had that much interlingual re-speaking. Many people are amazed that interlingual is even possible. They think this is very difficult. Uh, but we believe this can be done and people can be trained to become interlingual re-speakers and with the world becoming more and more multilingual, interlingual re-speaking and interlingual life subtitling, we think it's something that can really benefit people in many ways or, or people can benefit from it in many ways. And uh, what skills do you think are necessary to become a re-speaker? These are various skills uh, from various disciplines. Uh, they, they are related to being able to listen uh, and focus on what somebody says and then being able to process it quickly, to make decisions quickly and to re-express this maybe in the same language, maybe in another language. And then also to control your voice, to think about how you cooperate with the speech recognition software, to add things like punctuation, to predict certain problems that the speech recognition software might have with understanding what you're saying uh, and so on. So these are various skills that you need to have. That's right. And I know you work both as a re-speaker and as an editor or corrector or proofreader. There are different names for this. Um, do you think these roles should be separate or should they be done by one person? So this varies uh, among countries. Uh, in Poland, where I work, where my main market is, we use uh, teams of two people. So we always have a re-speaker and uh, a live corrector. And in Polish, we use the word moderator uh, to call this person. So we have a, a team of two people. But in some countries, it's just one person uh, who also corrects the output, the text. And in some countries, it's more people. So in France, it's actually three people who are doing this job. So it depends on the practices between markets. It also depends on what are the quality expectations and on your language uh, and so on. 
and um, what are the main problems that you face as a re-speaker? Are there any problems at all? Uh, there are many challenges. Um, uh, you're dealing with technology which is changing all the time. Uh, as a person who doesn't like change, uh, <laughs> this is a challenge and you have to constantly learn new things about technology. Another challenge is that this is a new territory, re-speaking. Some people know very little about it, so you have to educate them. It's a new service, they don't know what to expect, they don't know what sort of uh, things you need to have to be able to do your job. Uh, so it is a challenge of a new territory, but it's also exciting because with new territory come new opportunities. And do you, do you work on-site or do you work remotely? Can you do re-speaking at home in your pyjamas? How does that work? Uh, we don't currently do re-speaking in our pyjamas. Uh, we are mostly working on-site as of now. And that's because in, in a live event setting, uh, there are so many challenges and things that can go wrong that being there, it's just so much easier. Uh, but yes, we are also doing uh, some work which is done remotely and I think over time we will be transitioning to doing more and more work remotely because as there is uh, an increase of demand, you really cannot and you start having events uh, in outside of big cities uh, that require live uh, subtitles. You cannot really travel to all those places. It's very problematic, it's very tiring. So we need to find ways, new technologies, new software that would allow us to work in a sta stable and safe way with, with good quality remotely. Right, and uh, re-speaking is quite new, right? Uh, do you think it's important to have some standards or guidelines or some sort of protocols to uh, follow? Standards are very important uh, for a number of ways. So. Uh, First of all, this clarifies the expectations of what we are doing. Uh, also, it helps to avoid unfair competition uh, and it helps guarantee good quality. To give you one example, uh, we now have legislation which requires uh, live subtitling online when you are streaming certain events. Uh, and then you're looking for a company who delivers that and you can find a company who does that and they do a great job with great quality using re-speakers and uh, live correctors and so on. Uh, and you can have another company which will basically provide automatic speech recognition. They will create text which is gibberish, it provides no value to the users, there's no real access. But for an institution who's ordering the service, they might not see the difference. There if they no don't know, there's no quality benchmark. So if there's no benchmark, how do you know if you're doing a good job, if it's a success or a failure? We need such criteria. So um, re-speaking is a new profession. How did you become a re-speaker? So I, wa I, uh, uh, I found um, a great teacher in subtitling, which was you by accident. And I went on a course on SDH. And I remember at this course, you told us about that in some places in the world they have this magic practice of life subtitling. So it, is, it did seem magic to me at that time. And then uh, I got a job uh, as an in-house subtitler at, at the uh, public broadcaster and I started doing SDH. I started doing semi-life subtitling for the news. And I thought as, as the television was considering maybe at some point going into life subtitling and providing life subtitles, uh, I thought that would be a dream come true to get involved in such an exciting project and become one of the first people in Poland to, to work on live subtitling. Unfortunately, they fired me, so I lost that job, which is also, I think, an example to students that sometimes uh, you can have stages in your career which are difficult and you shouldn't give up. You shouldn't just look for a corporate job in another industry. It does make sense to yes, wait. But and I think be it patient. was to your benefit, actually. It was a blessing in disguise, in a way, because it allowed me to experience new things and meet new people. And I received a call from uh, Monika Szczygielska, who at that time, uh, being an accessibility expert, she had a dream of introducing live subtitling in, uh, in Poland. So she called me 
And here I was talking to this strange lady and I was a process person and not a people person. So this was challenging, uh, getting to know new people. And she said, there's this company uh, in the city of Wrocław, like six hours in a train away, and you have to go there if you want. And they will create a voice profile for you. So you will be able to use their speech recognition engine. And then let's see if it's good enough for us to create live subtitles. And then I hopped on a train and I ended up with those IT guys who are also process people. So it was very difficult for us to communicate. Uh, but somehow we managed to use the software to produce live subtitles for live events. And how, that's how I became a re-speaker. Uh, also with a great help uh, from you and the, project, the research project that you had at the University of Warsaw where you offered training workshops with experts from abroad. Uh, this was a great help for us to learn these new skills. So re-speaking is a new profession, as, um, as we said, compared to, uh, let's say, being a translator or interpreter. How does uh, that impact on the working conditions, on the payments, on uh, communicating with the client, etc.? I think I already said that it's a new territory, and with that there are challenges because you have to educate the people, right? They often don't know what the service is about, what are the conditions, technical conditions you need. Uh, that you need, uh, for instance, a booth, uh, which is uh, without any noise there. Uh, we used to have events where we would be put in a room with the catering company who would, and they would come with plates and cutlery creating lots of noise. So there's a lot of difficulty explaining things to people and educating people about this new service. Uh, but there's also opportunities coming with this new territory. So you can set, try to set your own standards. And we always think that re-speaking is very close to interpreting. And we try to have the same good practices and good standards which are in the interpreting. Uh, in are they? Could you tell us briefly? Uh, so interpreters are usually well paid uh, because it's a difficult job. It requires a lot of education. It's really tiring. Uh, you might think that the interpreter or re-speaker, in case of a live event, they just come for two hours or four hours or eight hours, but this is actually much more work. They have to get prepared in advance. They have to constantly work on their skills uh, and they have to be rewarded for that, for their energy, effort, time. Uh, and uh, they cannot work alone. Interpreters and re-speakers, they cannot go on working alone because they cannot sustain focus over a long period of time. We know that from research. How long can they uh, go on? Uh, I think the research usually s says that 20 or 30 minutes is the maximum. So after 20, 30 minutes, you should have a break. That's why uh, we always have a team of two re-speakers and they take turns. Some re-speakers think they are sort of superstars and they are super powerful and they could go on forever, but they don't realize the quality suffers and, and over time it's worse and worse. So it's very important to have the breaks. You also might be a young person full of energy and you might think you can go on forever, but then uh, you, turn, you, 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 you turn 30 or you turn 40, you have kids, you have all sorts of other problems and things and you need to have a sustainable job where you can deliver good quality without compromising your health. Yes, could you also tell us about the payments, uh, the working conditions and payments, how does that work? You mentioned as, parallels with interpreting. Sure, so as with interpreters, the payments and the conditions, this would depend on whether you are a freelance person working in live events settings or a more in-house person working for an institution. When it comes to, to live events, uh, on our market, the re-speakers are paid per day, or sometimes if it's a short event, they might be paid per half a day. How many hours is a day or half a day then? That would be a, a day, half a day would be four hours, and the day would be eight hours of work. Uh, and the idea is that if you have one event for a given day, even if it's one hour, then you won't be able to have another event on that day. Uh, and in professions such as re-speaking or interpreting, you cannot have an event every day, uh, even if clients had so many work for you, that would be impossible for you physically to have 
that much work because also you need to get prepared, you need to study reference materials and so on. Uh, so that's why they are not paid per hour, they are paid per day or per half a day. Looking into the future, how do you see uh, the profession of re-speaking uh, evolving? Um, okay, so uh, that question requires uh, us to look into the future. So let's look into the crystal ball. And I think there are many paths. Uh, one of the paths is that uh, free speaking can become obsolete. So what you would have is automatic speech recognition. And then that could be corrected by a life corrector. And it might turn out this is easier and then cheaper than using re-speakers. So that's a possibility. As speech, re as speech recognition becomes better and better, at some point having a little bit of human correction might be enough and you won't need re-speakers any further. So do we need to train re-speakers now? Then again, uh, I remember when I was starting re-speaking, that was already a few years ago, people were already telling me this job will become obsolete tomorrow. And so far it hasn't and it might not. Another path is that actually uh, re-speaking will continue to grow because this is a new service. There's a lot of people and institutions who don't realize yet the value of this service and the demand can grow exponentially. So we might need, and this is turning true as of now, we need more and more re-speakers uh, and we need to train them. Another uh, possibility is with interlingual re-speaking, there are also a few paths. So maybe let's look at the interlingual one. So at the ILSA project, we believe in the future of interlingual re-speakers, of people who are going from one language to the other. But there's also an alternative path. So you could train intralingual re-speakers to adapt their practices and create text in such a way that would be optimized for machine translation. So you would have live subtitling in one language and then it would be translated many other languages through machine translation. And you might be skeptical of machine translation, but it actually does a great job when it works with a text that has been pre-prepared, pre-edited with machine translation in mind. So if we teach we speakers to pre-edit the text in such a way that it's machine translation friendly, we could get subtitles in many languages at a very low cost and that's, that would provide a great access. That's super interesting. Could you tell us like very briefly uh, how would you do that? Because we normally talk about post-editing and pre-editing is uh, uh, something new, right? Uh, how would you prepare a text uh, to be machine translated? I don't really know because it's a new territory, but it is similar to uh, the practices of post-editing. So may maybe it's like the other way around. There's uh, this whole field of easy to read text. Uh, in uh, written text, like in documentation, they are uh, editing the documentation, the manuals for products in such a way that it, that it can then be translated by machine translation well. So we could look into those fields. And this is one of the scenarios that is possible. But there's also another path when this uh, doesn't work very well and as we believe uh, in the ILSA project, interlingual re-speaking will be a great, uh, a great service. And that's also because with interlingual re-speaking, um, I have to go a step back, to, to, but it's, I think, a very interesting idea. So, so far, until yesterday, actually, I always thought of live subtitling as an, an interlingual live subtitling, as a sort of new service and new, new option that can be used together with spoken language interpreting. So you could have interpretation for the event, but also uh, live subtitles, and there are different user groups, right? But yesterday I talked to Professor Margarita Truk, who's an interpreting scholar, and she was participating in an event with live subtitles, and she said, wow, interpreters are becoming obsolete. We can use live subtitles, interlingual subtitles, and we no longer need interpreters. And I thought about it for the first time, and it's true because the subtitles are more universal than interpreting, so more people can access them. And then if there are people who want audio, who want spoken language interpretation, they could just listen to re-speakers. And yes, re-speakers add punctuation, but people could get used to that. 
And then, uh, I've never thought of that before, but really you could have sub live subtitling, making, interpreting obsolete for some context, not yes, for all Yes, I'm a bit contexts. skeptical about that, if the audiences would be happy listening to people saying this, this, this and that, comma, this, this, this and that, full stop. Uh, yes, I'm also skeptical of it. But then I talked to her and she's an expert on interpreting. I never thought that, I would never say, I would never dare to say that live subtitling will take over interpreting. I always thought of it as a separate service that just is aimed at a different group. But that's what she told me and it makes sense that for some events it might be easier, it might be cheaper, it might be a way to reach more people, satisfy more demands with live subtitling, interlingual subtitling rather uh, than interpreting. And yes, it might feel a bit strange if you hear a full stop and comma, but then after a while you listen to it and you get used to it and maybe we already have speech recognition which adds a certain amount of punctuation automatically. We might get to a point where most of the punctuation is added automatically and then uh, the output, the spoken output of a, that the speaker creates will be very similar to interpreting and people will be able to use it, those who want. And many people would prefer to have live subtitles because it's just an, a, a service that's easier to access. This is fascinating. Uh, it is. Yes. Uh, so, summing up, uh, because I think we need to finish, um, would you recommend uh, re-speaking as a profession? Yes, I think it is an exciting profession. We need more and more re-speakers. Uh, we need more and more life correctors. This is also an exciting uh, profession. It's actually more difficult for us currently to find life correctors and to train them. But we're looking into that uh, as well. I think accessibility in general is such an exciting new field and it's so rewarding that you are providing access to people that I recommend everybody to get into this business. And if you have uh, better ideas than we, then we'll just lose our jobs and we'll move somewhere else. But I'm happy that we will have more access. All right, Lukas, thank you so much. Thank you for having me.